Stand with me, please. Thank you, Randy. Just say amen. 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 Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. It says, Well, a man robbed God, yet you have robbed me, but you say, In what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring you all the tithes of the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such blessing, that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Thank you. You may be seated. Malachi has been asking some questions. As we've been studying in that book, and he asked, first of all, are you just going through the motions? When it comes to worship, they ask, do you honor your commitment? Then last week we talked about, will you return to me so that I can return to you? And I guess today he's asking the question, will a man rob God? But actually I think what he's saying is, how do you treat God? Headlines. It says, our church was robbed recently. So we're thankful that no one was injured physically. But it will be some time before things are back to normal. It's clear that more than one person is responsible. In fact, there may be, actually be many people who have been party to the crime. Two things are most unfortunate about the robbery. One is that we have no assurances that it won't happen again. And that is a bit unnerving. The other unfortunate element is that we're certain that those who carried out the robbery are members of our church. It's bad enough to know that it theft has occurred, but it's really hard to imagine that professing Christians would actually steal from God and the ministries of His church. We can certainly hope that anyone who has participated in this act will repent and repay what has been taken. It's reported that some of the stolen money has been used for vacations, cars, boats, designer clothes, athletic equipment, homes, and even dining out. We don't have a complete list of all the suspects, but there is a consolation knowing that God does. You haven't read this in the papers, what one fellow had said, and hopefully you won't, but I realize that some of you will disagree, he says, but it would be difficult to get a conviction in the courts uh, give the clever way, given the clever way in which the robbery was carried out. You're probably also interested in how much was taken. The amount is undetermined, but at the very least exceeds many thousands of dollars. By the way, the robbery happened in full view of church Sunday morning. It happened as the offering place were passed during Sunday school and worship. It also happened as people who didn't come simply didn't give the Lord's time. Well, this is what was happening in Malachi's day. That's why the question was being asked. Well, a man robbed God. And in Malachi's day, this was happening. They had treated God badly by robbing from Him. And they, they had become, actually they had become bored with God. You know, and, I, and I, so as I read about that and thinking about it, I thought, how in the world can anyone become bored with God? Well, they were bored with Him. Their worship had turned from, from relational to a, a ritual thing. And as they, as the result, they offered, began to offer blemished sacrifices to God. Okay? And so... The, the priests have also uh, become unfaithful, as we talked about, I think, in chapter 1. They have become unfaithful. Divorce was a, a common place that was easy to do. And, and then their words worried God, wearied God, I guess. And, and businessmen were defrauding their workers. They were, uh, they were cheating their customers. They were taking advantages of, of orphans and widows and, and other people. But the worst thing of all that they were doing there, they were robbing God. They were withholding. What God had, their time, but they were giving God the worst instead of the best. So this is what, this is what Malachi is saying to them. Well, a man robbed God, and so I said, you've robbed me, but you say, in what way have you robbed you? You see, a lot of times, I think that even as they were there, sometimes we think, well, but God, I've been so good, and I've been, I've been so faithful to go to church and all these things, but yet, then we look and we say, but, but God, am I giving you my best? Am I giving you my best? Well, I think that 
their attitude was, in a sense, how little can I give God and still keep God happy? <laughs> Think about that. How little can I give God and still keep God happy? Malachi here presents, I think, as we've read here, about five statements that, that stand out in this passage about giving to God. And I do want to say that as they were, you know, they, they determined that, well, you know, we'll get by with giving God the least amount and, and expecting God to bless the greatest blessing. That's what they were thinking. So first of all, I thought as I read this, I thought first of all that he's telling us that the tithe is the minimum. I know, and I realize this is a very popular message among Baptist people today. They love to hear about tithing. I know they do. I know I, I shared with you once before the first message I ever preached on tithing was at a church that uh, my first church I pastored, and I never, I had never heard the word tithe in my life other than reading it here. It was a church that they never taught that. I guess they just assumed that everybody did. But but after God had called me to preach and I got to reading, I told Janetta, I said, honey, we're really missing something here. She said, what's that? I said, our tithe. So we discussed that. We started giving of our tithes unto the Lord, giving him his tithes. And I said, Shay, not I, but giving him his. And I, I realized the first time I, I ever preached on that, it was like a lot of you today. You, you know, that we didn't have the carpet on the floor, but you, you could have heard a pin drop. So quiet, and I can just tell they were loving it. It's like all good Baptists do, all good Christians do. We love to hear about tithing, don't we? Because we realize that gets into our billfolds and our pocketbooks, and we just love it when somebody gets in there. We know that. But he says, first of all, that the tithe is the minimum that we should be giving to the Lord. Well, the man of God, he said, You have brought me in your tithes and your offerings. And so when I look at that tithe, it means one-tenth. That's, and and you've got to remember this, folks. When we talk about a tithe, we say, I've got to give my tithe. No, you don't give your tithe. You give God's tithe. That's right. One-tenth. That's his. That's his. And I realize people say, oh, but you know, I really give a good offering when it comes around. That's different. That's different than your tithe. You know that? You need to understand that. The offering goes beyond your tithe. Okay? So he said, we look at that, and we look in the Old Testament, and I realize some folks say that, well, that was Old Testament days. Well, I got news for you that what you find in the Old Testament, Jesus said, I came to fulfill. I didn't come to destroy it. I didn't come to get rid of it, but I came to fulfill that. That's why he was a, the sacrifice, and they were singing about the cross. That's why Jesus went to Calvary to fulfill that sacrifice that was needed for man. So he said, I came to fulfill the law, not to destroy it. So I look in Genesis chapter 14 and, and verse 20. When we think about the tithe that he gives us, and he tells us to tithe, we find that Abraham, our father Abraham, that we, we read about so much, he, he began to tithe. Over chapter 14, uh, verse 20, he said, And blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemy to your hand, and he gave him a tithe of all. <laughs> I appreciate that song also that Randy sang this morning. Have you been through a fire? Have you been through a trouble? Have you been through a heartache? And you got through those and God brought you out of them. And it's easy for us to say, yes, he did. God, and because of that, I'm going to say amen. But you know, it goes beyond that, doesn't it? Really. If we give to God for what he's given to us, even a tithe is not enough. I want you to know that. Even a time is not enough. And I'm not saying God is telling us to, you know, you've got to do this. This is something I think that God says you have the privilege of doing. You have the privilege of doing. And not only that, but over in, in Leviticus, we'll also find here uh, about the tithe and how that he talks about uh, giving of the tithe to the Lord in chapter 27 and, and verse 30. When he says this, and he said... Uh, <coughs> find it here first of all. Oh, and, the, and all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, it is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. The first of the crop, the first of the fruits, he said, we need to give to God. Wow. We need to give to God. So we look at that and realize, he said, that is the minimum that we should be giving to the work of the Lord. We give to Him. And I think that, and as somebody said, well, one time a fellow was talking, he said, all right, here's the way it's going to be, Lord. What I will do, we'll put all the money in the offering tray, and what I throw up, and what stays up, Lord, is yours, and what comes down is mine. <laughs> you know, of course, we obviously 
all of us want to come down, isn't it? But when we stop and think about the tithe given to God, folks, let me tell you something. It is nowhere compared to what God has given to you. Nowhere compared to what God has given to you. I look over in the New Testament and I find that in 1 Corinthians as Paul writes about the tithe and he, he says this to us over in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 16 and verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia so you must do also on the first day of the week that each one of you lay something aside storing up as he may prosper that there be no collection when I come. What he's saying is that on that first day of the week on this Sunday, he said, you lay aside and what God, the way that God has prospered you. Wow, if we gave more than a tithe, the thing about it is, if we said, wait a minute, if I give more than a tithe, I give the way that God has prospered me. Let me tell you something. There will be a lot of folks today giving way beyond that tenth of what God expects of us. Because yeah. I tell you what, God has prospered folks, hasn't he? He's prospered folks. In a special way. So he said, lay, lay that aside every, that first day of the week. Give it there. Put it there. And he says, over in, remember, over, even over in Luke, in chapter 18. Remember, how about the, the Pharisee and the publican that were there? Even the Pharisee said, Lord, I give of my time all the time. Because I realized what he was saying. He was saying there that, that that's good enough, Lord, if I just give my tithe. Well, we understand and need to know this. That just because we give our tithe doesn't make, doesn't make sure that we're right with God. We get right with God when we give our heart to Him. When we get saved, that's when we're right with God. But giving of our tithe is saying to Him, Lord, I thank You. I thank You. You know, every time that we give of our tithe, that's what we're saying to Him. Lord, You put food on my table this morning. Yeah. You put clothes on my back. Lord, you've given me a job to, to help with my family, to get, meet their needs, and God, you've done all of that. Lord, because you've done it, I'm going to give back to you the way you have given to me. Oh, wow. And then I think over in 2 Corinthians, Paul also writes about the tithe and, and, and telling us what should take place there. In chapter, two, in chapter 8, in verse 12, when he says... For if there is first a willing mind, it is accepted to what one has and not according to what he does not have. He said we must have a willing mind to say, Lord, I'm giving to you. But he says we give with what we have, not what we don't have. You see, a lot of times when we... <coughs> somebody said the other day, talking about something, and I said, uh, and we were talking about some things. He said, oh, you know, you just need to go to the bank and man, they'll give you all the money you want. I said, yeah, that's, that's a good thing, I guess. They'll give me all the money I want. But the problem is, they want me to pay it back. They want me to pay it back. And so, really, what we're saying is that we're borrowing on something that we don't have yet. And we're saying, I'll give it to you later. You know, sort of like, uh, like Mimpy and Popeye. I'll, I'll, you know, for a hamburger today, I'll pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. You know? But what he's saying, we have a willing mind to give what we do have, not from what we don't have. Wow. So Paul says tithing is important. You see, tithing has always, tithing has always been the floor, not the ceiling of what we give to God's work. In other words, we say, well, man, I, I just... I'll get, I'm, I'm giving 10%. I mean, that's the highest I can give. No, it isn't. But he said, that's the ground floor. The more that we go beyond that. He says, that's the ceiling as it go higher and higher. But in other words, tithing is a place for us to begin. A place for us to begin, not the place to end in supporting God's kingdom work. You know, and as I began to begin to read in the book of Malachi, I began to study there, I said, oh, Lord, that means that when I get down to chapter 3, verse 8, I'm going to have to preach a tithing sermon. The sermons have been pretty good so far in Malachi until you get to here. Right? I'm going to get a lot of amens there. <laughs> but nevertheless, this is God's word. Nevertheless, <coughs> it, it is to be preached. So we look at that and realize that the tithe is the minimum that we need to give to God. Because he said, listen, even from Abraham on down, because you are so blessed. You are so blessed. And the second thing I thought about, get this, 
He says in, in verse 9, You are cursed with the curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. He said the curse came from disobedience. And he reminded them. He reminded them. He said, look at your failures. Look at what's happened. And I am not one of these guys that you'll find on TV that, that preaches prosperity because you you know you give you you know, give me a thousand dollar seed and tomorrow when you get to the mailbox you're gonna have fifteen thousand. Now if that would work I'd be giving a whole lot of thousand dollar seeds, wouldn't you? But that's not what I'm saying. But he said that you have you, your life has not prospered, you went the wrong direction, all because of the fact he said you have not given to me what you should be giving to me. Giving to me. Remember, I, and I always try to share this every time that I preach on a tithing message because I think it's important. Because this lady, this man in our church, the first church I pastored, he was even a, a deacon of the church. And, and as I began to teach about tithing and all these things, that, that he refused to do it. He said, I can't see it. He said, because every time I start to tithe, something happens at my house, I need that money. He said a refrigerator broke down, my washer and dryer broke down, all these other things would break down. Every time I start to tithe, I found out I needed that money for something else. So he was at my house one day, we were discussing that. About that time, my neighbor came in, rang the doorbell, and she came on in, and she happened to be a Church of God's preacher's wife. And I said, before you go back and find Jeanette in there somewhere, answer me a question. I said, for this deacon, I said, do you, Church of God people, believe in tithing? Of course, she looked at me like I was a nut. <laughs> and she said, yes, brother, we do. I said, well, my brother here says that every time he starts to tithe, that he finds out he needs that money for something else. And she, then she cut loose on him. <laughs> and she said, brother, let me tell you something. She said, it probably broke because you didn't give your tithe. She said, I'll tell you what I'll do for you. She said, if you will pay your tithe for one month, and if anything in your house breaks down for that one month, I'll pay for it. Well, glory. I should have thought, let's sign this piece of paper. But she told me, I will pay for everything that breaks down in your home if you will honestly give to God the way that you should give to Him. As far as I know, he still never did tithe. He was afraid, I guess, that she would do that. <laughs> but what I'm saying is this. The people there, they said they were cursed from their disobedience. And this is being, you know, when we don't give of our tithes, yet yeah, we're disobedient to God. Now, I don't want you leaving here this morning mad at me because of what God says. You know, you go ahead and shake my hand and hug my neck and you leave here this morning. And if you didn't get your tithes put in my pocket, I'll be sure to get the offering truck <laughs> before Paul leaves here today. But what I'm saying is this. They said they were, they were cursed because they were disobedient to God. And sometimes I think that, that we as God's people, that, that we lack a lot of things in our life and things happen in our life because we do not give to God. And, I, and, I, and I'm going to say this. And I, and I hope the ones that have done this for me don't, you know, Friday, or was it Thursday? Thursday, wasn't it? Thursday, I came to the funeral and, and I drove the church van down because, and I know, no, actually, actually, they came to pick me up in the hearse. And David Evans said, well, pretty good. I'm the, you know, you're the only person that I come and pick up and drop off in the hearse and you're still standing. <laughs> okay. But anyway, I rode in the hearse. So Jeanette was going to come down to church later for the funeral and, and she had called me. She said, the car won't start. The battery was dead. And uh, it happened a couple of times. As a matter of fact, it happened at a funeral once before. When I was out there, Grayson doing the funeral of, of uh, Jim Tilsley's mother, I got in the car and I was first one in line. I started, it wouldn't start at all, so I just jump in the hearse and go with them. They come back and give me a jump. So this happened a couple other times. And, and I'm thinking, you know, that battery's not that bad. It's only five years old. Or six. It's not that bad. It'll be all right. So we jump and it would go for quite a while. But then, so we were both kind of aggravated. So we're sitting there, when I get home, we're sitting there making some phone calls about a battery. And so we, we'd call. So Jeanette said, well, we, 
we going to write a check for it or how are we going to do this? And I said, well, not sure yet. So while we were pausing and thinking, I had a knock on the door. Some folks were standing there, gave me a card with some money in it. You know how much that is? Take it to the back. Amen. I thought, wow. Amen. Isn't that something? That's how God works, isn't it? That's how He does. That's how God works when you're obedient to Him. And what was happening with them, they were disobedient. So the curse came because they were disobedient. Folks, what I'm saying today is this. When you give to God, God's going to bless. He really is. Right. But it's not, we're not doing it just to get blessed, but we're doing it because we're being obedient to what He says for us to do. Amen. And then the third thing that I saw here, get this in verse 10. And man, this is exciting. This is a great exciting part here. Bring you all the time in the storehouse. And He said, and that there be no, no need or no food in my house. He said, the storehouse. Bring it to the storehouse. Do you ever hear these guys on TV say to you, you go ahead and send us your tithe and your offering? Well, don't ever do that. Don't ever send them your tithe. That is not the storehouse. The storehouse is the local church where you are. This is where God's work begins for you. This is the storehouse. So he said, bring it to the storehouse. He said, that way, when there is a need, it will be taken care of. <laughs> Boy, as I got to thinking about this message, even as I prayed about this, it came at a pretty good time. <laughs> I got to do this for you. We're having a business meeting tonight at the church. <laughs> because we're buying a church van. And we need to pay for it. <laughs> Whoa! Pretty good timing, huh, Paul? <laughs> And it wasn't meant to be that way. It just happened that way. But what I'm saying, bring it to the storehouse. This is where your tithe belongs. So that we are able to continue God's work. The local church is the storehouse where God's work gets done. Just the other day, get to church and Melissa has two notes on there. One was for some folks who needed an electric bill paid. And one was for some folks who needed some food. So these things happen regularly, quite often. That's why it's a storehouse. So here we go. We minister to those kinds of people. We minister to those who need help financially. We minister to those who, who need help with food. Oh, we minister to those who need God's Word. Wow. I called the other day a man about our mission trip. And he began to tell me about, oh, he said, oh, wait a minute, Tom, wait a minute, wait a minute, i got to back up. He said, you're not going to be staying here at our church. He said, because we have a group from Chicago that's coming in the same time you are. And he said, now we're putting you at another church, and you're going to be staying at a farmhouse. And he said, by the way, he said, I know, and I've talked to the man about Habitat for Humanity, and he asked about what my people could do, and I said, they can paint, they can do whatever. My, I said, my folks can do whatever you want them to do. He said, can they do landscaping? I all they can do. So then they gave me another phone number of, a, of, a, he said, uh, of, a, of the church. And, and he said, this is the, the pastor. And he said, by the way, he said, I just talked to that pastor a moment ago. What you talked to the other fellow? He said, can your, can your people put on a, he said, we have all the supplies, but can your people put on a, a, metal, a, a metal roof on a house? I said, yes, they can. <laughs> I hope you can. <laughs> and I got to thinking how God blesses us to minister to others. But not only here. I mean, we, we realize that we, we minister to those around the world because of the cooperative program that we give. But both folks, let me tell you, you really don't know how much we take care of people here, even in our own community. And he said, bring it to the storehouse. So therefore, that there'll be, it, it'll be there. It'll be there when needed for the work of the kingdom. So then he also said that same verse, and I like this part too. Now, it, 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 this fourth point is the fact that he says that there be, 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 there be food in my house. In other words, it'll be there when it is needed. And he says that if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Here we can test and challenge God to bless us. He said, what I'm saying to you is you bring it to the storehouse. He said, you're going to be blessed. All you have to do, he said, is just trust me with everything. Trust me with everything. When 
we give it to God. We want to trust Him with our, we want to trust Him a lot of time, and we do, with our salvation. We have to trust Him for that. But we fail to trust Him with our finances a lot of times. I think that we try to cope on our own with our finances, and that would be, you know, be a good topic, you know, sometime to, to speak on about our finances, how we take care of those. But, but God said, you just got to learn to trust me. And by giving of our tithe to Him, we're saying to Him, Lord, I'm just trusting you. I am trusting you. So he said, bring it. And there will be a blessing that you won't, <laughs> that there's just not room enough to receive it. You ever feel like you've been blessed so much that you said, well, wow, Lord, I just don't know. It, you, it's sort of like, it's sort of like this. It's sort of like my 30 pounds of peanut butter <laughs> that I got. <laughs> That I got for pastor appreciation. There was so much of it that in our condo I had no room to put it. So it's in the corner of my office. Actually, what's left of it, which is one can. I don't know what it's a three pound can. Is that what it is? A four pound can? About like that. That's all that's left of that 30 pound of peanut butter. Can it show? <laughs> that's all that's left of it. Had so much of it. And blessed with it so much that I had not a room to put a place to put it at the house. So I had to find a, a storage place. And, I, and I, I put it in the corner, put a chair in front of it, <laughs> and make sure that it's fastened down so nobody, not even the cleaning lady, would get my peanut butter. But I'm blessed with it. That's what he's saying here. He's saying that I'll give you such a blessing that you'll feel like there's not even room enough to receive it. Wow. And then finally, that again, as I look at that, not only do we bring it to the storehouse, not only is it that, is that we test God, you challenge God to bless us. And you know, isn't it, it, it amazing how that God blesses us even when we don't think we can even be blessed? And I, you know, we sit sometimes and, and we say, go ahead, bless me if you think you can. And somehow God does it anyway. Well, now, then finally he says, the blessings are out of this world for you and I. The blessings are out of this world. You see, he tells us in Luke, he said, give and it shall be given you, pressed down and shaken. That's what it is. Pressed down and shaken. The blessings are so much out of this world. When we give ourselves to God and when we put him and give him first of everything, Give him the blessings are out of this world. <laughs> Over in Corinthians, Second Corinthians again, in verse chapter nine, I think that Paul says it like this in verse six and seven. He said, "But I, that this I say: He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully." So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Wow. So don't leave here this morning thinking, boy, I tell you what, the preacher said that I've got to give. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you ought to want to give to God. And he said he loves a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. You know, it's just like at, at Christmas time. I, I, I'll use my, my girls and, and, as an example and, and my son-in-law and, and my daughter. At Christmas time, I don't care if they never get me another Christmas present. Now, I like the one they got me last year, my dog now. We, we won't go there. But it will always thrill my heart to know that I'll be giving them. I'm giving them something. And you know what? The thing about it is, whether they like it or not, they've never said they didn't like anything. They always thank us. They always hug us and they say, boy, I just love it. They don't lie. So, they had to love it. So, right? Okay, thank you. Good son too. But, but what I'm saying is this, that, and it just thrilled Jeanette not to be able to give to them. Jeanette's sister one time asked Jeanette why she baked the cakes and pies and and do some things and take them to people that were sick at home and, and take them to other people, people that even next door to us that needed things and we'd take them. And why do you do that? Don't you know? She said that that costs a lot of money for you to do those things. Why do you do that? It's because we love to give. 
think that's what God says to each of us. To be a cheerful giver. Not, he said, he said, but this I say, who, he who sp sows sparingly, if you go out and you plant a garden and you just throw things, just sparingly put things out and when it comes time to reap, you're just, that's what you're going to have, just what you put in the ground. But if you go out and you take that garden and you sow and, and you begin to sow bountifully and, and, and uh, you know, you, you get that honey select corn. Oh, corn. Had some yesterday. And you, you get that honey select corn and you begin, if you're going to plant one row, that's all you're going to get is one row. But if you go plant the fields full of that thing, heaven is near. Because you begin to reap all of that. And that's what he's saying here. If you sow sparingly, your blessings are going to be sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. <laughs> Chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians, and I'm going to close. But. And verse 1 says, Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. That in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of ministry to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first get, now here's the key, here's the key to all of them. But they first gave themselves to the Lord. And then to us, by the will of God. The key to it is, giving yourself first to the Lord. Giving is God's way of financing His church. Because you see, God never, in, 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 God never intended for us to do, uh, be funded by bingos and raffles and all these kind of things. But, but by giving to the church, He expects His people to return the church with part of their income. And the purpose of the tithes is to support God's work. I think that when we look at that, but the primary purpose, you know, we understand it's God's work, but the primary purpose of giving of our tithes, yes, is to support God's work, but it's to put God first in our lives. You know? The tithe was not a legalistic regulation. It was more than the Old Testament income tax. God had a special uh, he, he had a special purpose in asking for the tenth. It was to teach his people to put him first in everything. When we put God first in, in, in our giving, then we're going to put him first in every area of our life. We really will because we're saying, Lord, we, we just trust you with that. This simple truth, it's the, it's the heart of giving. We understand that. But we pay God first. But too many people do it in reverse. <laughs> if there's anything left, then we'll give what we have left to God. I've often thought, what if God done this thing for us? If there's anything left, I'll give to you. <laughs> That's what was happening in Malachi's day. They were giving God the leftovers, and as a result, they were robbing God. And I thought about what Paul said. But give the Lord first. And in a sense, as I thought about that, I thought, give yourself first to the Lord. I thought, there may be some here this morning that's robbing God in that way that you have never given God, given God yourself. You're robbing God. Because you know what? God can take you and use you for His glory, for His kingdom, and yet... You're not saved. You've never given yourself to Him and to allow God to do that. Then you're robbing God of the pleasure of saying, you're my child. Well, maybe, maybe there's others who are doing like they did in Malachi's day, just plain old robbing God with their tithes and their offerings. And, and Lord, I belong to you. I just can't afford to give to you. I'll give what I have left over. But God says, don't give me the leftovers. I want the first. You put him first in your time. You'll put him first in the rest of your life. I guarantee you. So this morning, I'll hit you now. Father, I pray today that your will be done here this morning. I thank you for the message you've allowed me to preach today, dear Lord. And Father, I don't ever want to say anything on my own that would
hurt anyone. But God, I want it to come, always come from what you give me. So Lord, I pray this morning that you'll speak to hearts in a special way today. There may be those, dear Lord, that have never given them, themselves to you totally. They've never come to you and to be saved. They've never, never repented their sins. They've never said, here I am, Lord, save me. I give my life to you. There may be some, dear Lord, who are saved and you, you are their Savior, but they've never made you their Lord of their life. They've never really put you first in all that they do. So God, I just ask that you'll speak to hearts. I that you'll have your way today. God, we love and we praise you and we thank you. Thank you for supplying our needs every day. Not only our, our physical needs at home with our food and clothing and shelter and these things, dear God. And even the joys of life that we have, the pleasures of life you provide for us. But Lord, for our spiritual needs, our mental needs. God, we thank you for that. There may be those, as Randy has said this morning, they're going through the fire and going through some tough times. Lord, I know you can supply the need there by comforting them and giving them strength. So Lord, I just pray you bless. Maybe there's those that, again, have not made you the Lord of their lives and that want to give you the leftovers of their life, the leftovers of their income. God, speak to hearts. Or that each of us, when we leave here today, can truly say, Lord, my mind and heart is clear because, God, I'm giving you my first. And we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name.